Our topic today is medications used for nausea and vomiting. Nausea is the disagreeable feeling that often comes on before vomiting. Vomiting or emesis may be self-induced and voluntary, as with eating disorders like bulimia, or involuntary as a defense mechanism, with a wide variety of causes. Some causes include chemotherapy-induced, postoperative, due to exposure to anesthetics, associated with disease processes, due to organ damage, or from exposure to a wide variety of harmful substances. Nausea and vomiting are also common in pregnancy, especially during the first trimester. Recurring emesis during pregnancy can lead to a dangerous condition known as hyperemesis gravidarum, where electrolytes and fluids get out of whack. This affects both the mother and the unborn baby. As you may have experienced, nausea and vomiting may also be precipitated by motion or seasickness. It can also be brought on by memories, odors, tastes, and sight. For example, seeing or smelling a cadaver or getting a whiff of smelly feet. As mentioned, general anesthetics, especially inhaled volatile liquids, such as desflurane, are well known to cause nausea and vomiting in the patient after they wake up. This is known as post-operative nausea and vomiting, abbreviated PONV. Not only is this uncomfortable for the patient, but with vomiting, there is increased risk for tearing sutures. Putting excessive pressure on organs and increasing intracranial pressure. Remember that ongoing emesis will cause disturbances in electrolytes, fluids, and acid-base balance. Pregnant women, the elderly, and the very young are especially prone to developing these life-threatening imbalances. It's useful to remember that prolonged emesis is more likely to lead to alkalosis. This is due to the loss of acid from the stomach from all the vomiting. Conversely, prolonged diarrhea is more likely to lead to acidosis due to the excessive loss of bicarbonate ions in the feces. Remember that bicarbonate ions are made by the pancreas and secreted into the lumen of the small intestine to neutralize stomach acid. These bicarbonate ions are lost with lots of diarrhea. The control centers for nausea and vomiting include the chemoreceptor trigger zone and the vomiting center, both located in the brainstem. These two control centers receive afferent information from the vestibular system of the inner ear, gastrointestinal tract, and cerebral cortex. When these centers become activated, they release five main neurotransmitters which bring about nausea and vomiting. These neurotransmitters include dopamine, serotonin, histamine, acetylcholine, and substance P. When the vomiting center is activated, it sends out efferent signals to elicit emesis. For example, it sends efferent signals to the salivary glands to increase secretion, and to the diaphragm to increase intra-abdominal pressure, and also to the muscles of the upper GI tract, to reverse peristalsis. Together, these actions bring about the act of vomiting. Medications used to prevent emesis and nausea are known as anti-emetics and anti-nausea drugs. Most of the medication classes used to prevent and treat nausea and vomiting act to block the effects of the elevated five neurotransmitters. The first is anticholinergics which block the effects of elevated acetylcholine and include scopolamine, which may be administered as a patch applied behind the ear to prevent motion or seasickness. Trimethylbenzamide is also in the anticholinergic class. Serotonin receptor antagonists, more specifically 5-HT3 antagonists, like ondansetron, grenisetron, and polonisetron, block the effects of serotonin release 
from antichrofin-like cells in the gastrointestinal mucosa, as well as in the vomiting center and chemoreceptor trigger zone in the medulla oblongata. Indications for 5-HT3 receptor antagonists include preventing and treating nausea and emesis associated with cancer treatment, like cisplatin, radiation therapy, and for post-operative nausea and vomiting. Notice the generic names end in citron. It's a shortened version of the word serotonin. These medications are even more effective when they are administered with dexamethasone and a prepotent. Unlabeled uses for ondansetron include bulimia, alcoholism, and hyperemesis gravidarum. The next category is antihistamines and includes medications such as diphenhydramine, dimenhydrinate, and meclizine. These are especially useful to prevent nausea and vomiting related to motion sickness, and they also have anticholinergic properties to additionally block acetylcholine. There are a lot of NK1 receptors in both the CTZ and vomiting center. The ligand for this receptor is substance P. A prepotent is selective for the NK1 receptor and blocks substance P. A prepotent is used to prevent nausea and vomiting associated with cancer treatment and PONV. Antidopaminergic drugs like prochlorperazine, promethazine, and chlorpromazine are used for nausea and vomiting, as well as psychiatric disorders such as schizophrenia, and to treat intractable hiccups. One of the very useful dosage forms for these dopamine antagonists is suppositories. Like the antihistamines, these antidopaminergic medications also have anticholinergic properties. Metoclopramide has both antidopaminergic and anticholinergic properties. It is used as an antiemetic. It is also a prokinetic. That promotes gastric emptying into the duodenum making it useful in the treatment of reflux or regurgitation. Long-term use of metoclopramide may lead to movement disorders like tardive dyskinesia. Dronabinol may be used when other medications don't work well. Dronabinol acts as a CB1 receptor agonist in the brainstem and gastrointestinal tract and is also used to stimulate appetite in cancer and AIDS patients. Over-the-counter abbreviated OTC, medications like emetrol and nausea relief contain sugars like dextrose and fructose with phosphoric acid. These substances delay gastric emptying by reducing smooth muscle contraction in the GI tract. The same concept was used when your mom gave you 7-Up to settle your stomach. It's also important to know that the herbal remedy ginger is marketed for its anti-nausea properties. Notice the various locations where these antiemetics exert their actions. To summarize, nausea and vomiting can be caused by a wide variety of substances and conditions. These include reactions to certain odors, self-induced, overeating, emotional distress such as fear, motion or seasickness, food poisoning, infections, disease states, various injuries, organ damage, various types of pain, for example from a kidney stone or migraine headache, chemotherapy and radiation, anesthetics, and many other medications, alcohol, and various harmful substances. It is also associated with pregnancy, especially in the first trimester. If it persists during pregnancy, it can develop into a serious condition known as hyperemesis gravidarum. Remember that ongoing emesis can cause dehydration as well as electrolyte and pH abnormalities. Pregnant women, the elderly, and the very young are especially prone to developing these life-threatening imbalances. The two control centers are the CTZ and vomiting center in the brainstem. Remember that they receive afferent information from the inner ear, gastrointestinal tract, 
and cerebral cortex. Also remember the five neurotransmitters that may increase with nausea and vomiting, including dopamine, serotonin, histamine, acetylcholine, and substance P. Remember the classes of medication for nausea and vomiting, including anticholinergics, 5-HT3 antagonists, antihistamines, antidopaminergics, prokinetics, NK1 receptor antagonists, CB1 receptor agonists, and phosphorated carbohydrate solutions. Notice that most of these are antagonists, except for CB1 receptor agonists and phosphorated carbohydrate solutions. Now for some questions. Pause the video and determine your answers. If you answered B, you are correct. If you answered E, you are correct. If you answered E again, you are correct. If you answered C and G, you are correct. If you answered B, you are correct. Thanks for watching.